Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. And today on the show, I'd like to welcome Deborah Workman, NLP trainer, life coach, and speaker. Deborah works with individuals to help them refine their ability to achieve extraordinary results. She addresses concerns of disconnection, disassociation, and disempowerment with her training, helping people find deeper fulfillment within their careers. And so I just want to give a big welcome and shout out to Deborah Workman for joining us today. Hey, Deborah. Hey, Casey. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Happy yes. to be here. So just so our listeners can understand how important this is, what time is it where you are? It's actually a good time. It's 11 a.m. on Thursday. On Thursday. <laughs> because you are coming to us from New Zealand. Correct. That yes. is amazing. You know, and that I think that really goes to show the power of connections that you and I got connected from the United States to New Zealand, and it was such a powerful connection. And I always like to share with our audience because – I really want people to pay attention to who they're meeting in their life and who that person might introduce them to next. And we were introduced by the fabulous, say it. Berta Medina. <laughs> she gets Love so many shouts out, shout outs on this. She is just amazing. So um, tell us a little bit more about your background. How'd you get into NLP? Oh gosh, how did I get into NLP? So I've been um, a coach for at least five years now. And when I first started discovering how I wanted to coach, a lot of it was the theory, a lot of it was the psychology element, and a lot of it was talking. And I loved that. However, what I discovered is, like myself, there was some deeper, I'll call them kind of darker spots in my childhood and my previous you know, years and early years of life that talking wasn't helping. It wasn't enough to get me out of that spot of feeling a little bit um, ashamed or not good enough or whatever it was at that particular moment or memory I had in life. So I thought, how can I help my clients in a holistic approach where I'm not just talking to them to hope they feel better about themselves, but I'm actually providing some form of healing, some form of deeper um, service that they can actually have their past and feel peace, make peace with it and not feel like it's always on their shoulder reminding them of something they felt at the time. I and so welcome I, NLP. I love that and I'm so intrigued by NLP. So, you know, as a recruiter, I work with many candidates that don't like the job they're in, but they enjoy the work they do. So what advice can you share with people in this situation? Wow, it's actually quite common here as well. And what I what I coach my clients around, because quite often people come to me at that tipping point. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave my job or I'm going to leave my husband or I'm going to leave something. They feel like they've got to make a black and white decision. And what I sit down and do initially is I get really uh, get them really specific and clear on what it is that they do not like in their life right now. And then on the flip of that, the contrast is what is it that they do want? Mm. And what I'm finding with people wanting or seeking career changes, there's usually two typical reasons they're wanting to change or leave the job they're in. The first one is, is a total complete lifestyle change. They're either going to leave where they are and do something different, or they're going to move somewhere else and live and start a new life. The other, and I'm finding this more common than the first, is some a manager change. Mm. They're, a conflict in the workplace where the leader or the manager or the co-worker or the colleagues, they're not, they're not in sync with each other. They don't feel in alignment with each other. And this is where I found NLP so useful because if you can see a person beyond their behavior, like see right beyond their behavior and see possibly the innocence behind why they do the things and say the things they do, it opens up a world of freedom because you get a greater perspective and you, you don't take the behavior personally you're able to step back and go, wow, what must it be like in that person's shoes? 
for mm. them to have to act in that way, for them to have to treat people in that way. And when you can expand your perception and perspective to that degree, that person's behavior no longer bothers you. I, I love everything you've just said. There were so many little golden nuggets in there, but I want to <laughs> kind of go back to the perception because that's so yes. important. And, I, and from what I'm hearing you say, the neurolinguistics helps people with the, it's it's a mind trick right and, and i'm not it's saying sure nlp is. is but it is no. you know and we yeah. do this every yeah. single day in our lives when we address situations or when we see situations and you know i mean you know uh the coaching school that i just went through is all about your perceptions your levels of awareness and you know whether you see it as from a victim perception because of those mm -hmm. limiting beliefs, because of those things that, that shame, that fear, that guilt that's been holding you back. I think that is speaking exactly to what you're talking about and how this could help people going forward. Um, another thing, and I was just thinking of a situation too, when you were talking about people that leave their jobs and, you know, that, um, you know, what are they running away from? Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I've worked with clients that they want to leave their job, but then the same situation keeps popping back up. So, what do you do about that? And I think it's exactly what you just said. You've got to address the real issue. Yeah. And people go, well, how do I address the real issue? So I'm happy to speak into that as well. Yes, like please. Now, yes. Oh, so what happens? And sometimes I like sharing my own personal stories or and metaphors. So let's say the gym, a person wants to lose weight, right? So they join a gym and the, the weight doesn't fall off. So then they join a CrossFit class and that weight doesn't fall off. And then they join a kickboxing class and they're trying different forms to lose weight because they're wanting to change the behavior they're doing. They're starting to work out. What I find with my clients who want to shed some kilos is we have to go further back. We have to go to what are they thinking mm -hmm. about weight? What is your relationship with your own body? What are the feelings they feel about their weight and exercise? And then that drives the behavior, therefore the person's results. So if we can get back to the thought and, and rewire that thought if it's not serving their highest health and greatest good. For example, if someone's thinking, I'll always be big, I'll always be fat, my parents were big, my, my grandparents were big, I'm stuck in this body, that's gonna deliver feelings of helplessness. That's gonna deliver feelings of you know being at this low vibration, this low mood state. And then if you come in and try and change the behavior with that initial thought and feeling, the success rate's gonna be low. You actually have to get back to the thought and go, hang on, is it worth having this thought? And this is where the NLP and intervention work comes in because we actually, I'll use the word, we actually remove that limiting belief or that negative thought that person has about themselves and we replace it with the truth. Mm. And we open up their mind to actually go, whoa, this is something I decided at the time, but it's not who I am. And there's, there's just powerful, profound magic that happens when they can rewire their thoughts. Wow, this is such good information. And I love that you said that. So I'm curious, I've been reading a lot about the reticular activation system. Does that mm -hmm. play into NLP at all? Because that's a lot of what controls what we see. Absolutely, it does. It very, it so does. So visualization is, is quite big in NLP. And also, and when you're going, I know we're going to talk about job interviews as well, I hope. So I talk about how you bring that into work for you rather than visualize the worst case scenario and go into an interview feeling nervous. So the re, uh, going back to your question, how it plays a key in NLP is what you set your mind to, what you focus on, that goes into action to go and deliver that for you. Mm -hmm. So if you're going into a situation where you're feeling doubt or dread or, or fear or terror, unfortunately, you're attracting that because yes. that's where your focus is. So if you can get back and go, hang on, I'm actually feeling in a place of courage right now and I'm excited about doing something out of my comfort zone, you start seeing more of that evidence. You start seeing more excitement. You start feeling courageous. So it truly is what you set your mind to, you can create. I, I love that. And this is a subject that I'm so fascinated with. I had somebody tell me the other day, they're like, you are so lucky. And I'm like, I'm not lucky. I look for opportunity everywhere. I have trained my brain to look for opportunities. And because I look for them, I find them. And so, and that 
reticular activation system, often referred to as the RAS, is such a powerful little piece of our brain. I really encourage people to, you know, check it out, go look, go do some research on it and see how powerful that is and how that negative thinking or that stinking thinking, as uh, Zig Ziglar used to call it, it doesn't serve you. It's not going to help you be successful. So, so, and that leads right into my next question. So why do some people feel successful but are still dissatisfied with their careers? Mm -hmm. This question makes me smile because that was me um, mm. many years ago when I was in the corporate arena. And what I discovered, I didn't know it at the time, was my outer success wasn't connected to my inner fulfillment. So I was out there creating what I thought would make me feel satisfied, would make me feel complete. And when it wasn't working, I went and chased more and more of it. So I got stuck in that rabbit wheel of um, when then. When I get that promotion, then I'll be happy. Mm. When I meet that man, then I'll be happy. When I buy that second, third, fourth, fifth house, and guess what? I chased a few of those things, and when I got them, the happiness wasn't there. And if it was, it was for a fleeting moment, and then I found something else, and then I found something else. So that success is very elusive, and it's different for everyone. You know, I, my success to your success, I'm sure if we described it, Tracy, it would be very, very different. So. What I've noticed is some people, um, like myself, would rather chase that success than feel better about themselves. Mm. And that's where the dissatisfaction comes in. Because they keep thinking in order to feel better, it's something that has to happen, something that has to happen outside of them. They don't realize it's something that's within, they just haven't opened up that innate, innate well-being within. Okay, so I want to share something <laughs> with you that I say all the time, and you tell me if this is what you're talking about, okay. because I think yeah. it's so important. I used to be like, just like, and I love that when then, totally stealing that from you, when then. Um, but I used to be that person like, when Christmas gets here, then I'll be happy, you know? Or when I get to go on that trip, then I'll be happy. And then the whole time I'm on the trip, I'm worrying about when it's going to be over, okay? And so now... I've learned to focus and my mantra is to enjoy the journey. Enjoy every mm. moment of the yeah. journey because we're all going to the same place, right? There's only yeah. one end in sight for us. We don't know when that is, but you've got to enjoy every step of the journey. And I feel like if I were to describe my success, that would be it. That I'm enjoying this moment right here with you just as much as I'm going to enjoy the next moment when I go have dinner with some friends. Agree. And you're bringing that in, yeah. right? You're putting your mind on that and it's feeling good right now and you're going to create more of that. So I love, it's exactly what I was referring to. That perfect example. You know, and I also heard somewhere that like when you anticipate something and it's okay to anticipate, but not to forego the moment when you're anticipating that you live that moment then, then you live the moment in the real world. And then when you reflect back, you live that moment again. Do you believe that? I do, and it's similar to um, what I learned. I feel like I'm dropping NLP in everywhere. It's um, just because it's a good example. We do a visualize, visualization technique where I picture something that's coming up for me, mm -hmm. going through to um, completion, and I, and I imagine it, and I look back and realize how um, easy it was, how effortless it was, and how good I felt, and how everyone in the room was able to receive and learn something, if that's what I, my intention was. And then I come back to now and let it go. And I guarantee it happens just as how I imagined, just as how I visualized. And so important. Really Visualization is so important. So, <clears throat> okay, since we keep talking about NLP, what is NLP and how can it help people reprogram their minds? Sure. Yeah, I love talking about this. Okay, so I'll do the Reader's Digest version. Otherwise, you'll be kicking me off before we get to the next question. Um, neuro-linguistic programming. So NLP, that's what it stands for. So N is the neuro. So it's all about our mind, the physical, the mental, the emotional components of our neurology. And I'll give you an example shortly. Linguistic is the language element. Not only how we communicate with others, because we put a lot of focus on how we communicate with others, right? But more important than that is how we communicate with ourselves. We do it all the time. We just don't realize what we're saying to ourselves. And 
usually it's not very nice things. So that's really what was mind blowing for me in NLP. I got aware of what my little inner critic was telling me mm-hmm. um, and it wasn't serving me and it was driving my bus of life and creating and delivering things in my life that I was like, huh, I, didn't really I, I want wanted- that to happen. I want to throw something in there just real quick because you said that and that inner critic, oh, that's so hard to quiet. Meditation is a great tool for that. But I had one of my mentors tell me one time, they're like, Casey, if somebody had held a megaphone up to your head and people could hear what you're saying to yourself, you would be committed. And I was like, oh, (laughs) so sorry to interrupt, but no, I agree. We, what I learned is we abuse ourselves with our own thoughts. We do, and do you know what? We have around seventy to 90,000 thoughts a day. I, I believe my busy mind was up at 90,000 easily. Mm-hmm. Of those 90,000 thoughts a day, 80% of them are repetitive. So we're thinking what we were thinking about yesterday, the week before, the, the year before, sometimes you know, from childhood. We're mm-hmm. repeating these thoughts, some good, some not so good. Of those thoughts that are repeated, 80% of them are negative. 80% wow. of our negative thoughts of 90,000 thoughts are negative. And we just keep thinking about them and keep thinking about them and keep thinking about them. That is incredible. And really, yeah, it woke me up to go, hang on a minute. How is this possible? And I'm not consciously aware of it. That is, okay. So I interrupted you. You got to the N and the L. Oh, sorry. The P is for programming. So this is, again, how we store and run strategies in our mind, maybe past experiences, memories, thoughts, our emotions. It's all how it affects our lives. Like if I was to give you an example, when I go to buy a car, I have a strategy for buying a car that's unconscious. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even aware, well, I wasn't aware of it until I actually sat down and had a, a wonderful coach help me with it. So when every decision we make in our life, we have a strategy for it. We have a strategy to love. So my strategy to know um, I feel loved by my husband will be yours. We don't pay much attention to it though. And where it's useful is when there's a disconnect in the relationship or disconnect in the workplace, understanding what your strategy is for you to end up feeling, um, you know, not worthy at work or not good enough and really taking steps back on how you got there because if you can uncover what the strategy is you can make changes to it so you don't always have that same outcome that makes you feel miserable well and i think writing scripts in your head and i think and i feel like nlp is a great tool to stop those scripts and write new ones is such a detriment to most I I know it was for me when I finally and I had a coach on this too when I finally stopped writing scripts in my head and I'm not gonna say I never do it it's natural but because you want to fill in those gaps of information that you don't have and it's usually with something negative unless you're really working on it but when I stopped doing that you know that's so many moments of fear I didn't have to have anymore it was beautiful correct Beautiful. Life just gets easier around you when you can really, um, so basically NLP is like learning the language of the mind and creating more of the thoughts and feelings that you want to have and ditch the ones you don't. And when I I say ditch, you don't beat them up or anything. You just don't give them any more airtime. They don't take up any more space and they don't take your focus away from what it is you want. And that made my life so much more simpler, quieter upstairs because we- For sure we love our minds we we hang out there we live up there for <laughs> quite a bit of our life and um i just realized that um i started craving ordinary like i talk about it and i say ordinary for me is the new special when we get up when we give up wanting to be special we realize being ordinary is the new special so interesting my life isn't as busy as it used to be and i may have not have i don't have what i wanted to achieve front of mind anymore Yet I am so fulfilled in the simple things, simple things like noticing a tree, noticing a flower, being with my dog in the morning, just these small things that I didn't see when I was running on, I don't know what you call it, stress and adrenaline to be more successful in my career. Yeah. And and that leads me kind of to my next question, because I think we had talked about this before, but how does being a perfectionist cause harm to one's personal and professional life? There's no off switch. When you're a perfectionist, you're on 24 seven. Yes, you may sleep, but even while you're sleeping, you're thinking, you know, what am I doing tomorrow? What next, what next, what next? And 
I found it for me and my clients that I now coach. It's interesting where you were is generally what you end up coaching people through, which is great because you're not just sharing knowledge and intellect, you're sharing insights and experience. So bringing it back to the question, I found that the perfectionism was from high self expectations that I was placing on myself, which was uh, a mental, physical and emotional aspect to it. And my nervous system was shocked. I wouldn't admit that I was a perfectionist because I didn't want it to see, seem like a bad thing. I just thought, well, at least I've got high, high aspirations. I know what I want and I would like protect it because I thought if I wasn't a perfectionist, I wouldn't achieve what I was setting out to get. And I didn't want to look like I was, uh, I guess, wrong or broken or not good enough. So it was almost like a compensating behavior to cover up some of those beliefs we talked about earlier. That was a behavior of mine. It wasn't who I was. You know, and I think that, first of all, I want to ask you a question. Do you believe that's yeah. taught, that that's a taught or a learned behavior? The perfectionism? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It was learned. And it usually is from something so small, like I'll give you an example of how I learned mine. A teacher once told me, because um, I got 100% on an exam and I, don't, I didn't normally always get the A pluses. And she said, well done, Deb, keep up the great work. What I made it mean at age 12 was I always have to get 100%, otherwise I'm not delivering great work. She didn't say that to me, but my <laughs> mind tricked me into believing that's what my new mantra was going to be. And that was suffocating throughout school because getting 100% in everything, it, it, was, it was impossible for me. Someone else might be able to do it out there. With not many people. I just couldn't. <laughs> But I kept wanting to get it. And if I got 98%, I wouldn't, I wouldn't celebrate the 98%. I would ruminate over the 2% I got wrong. Mm. And that's when you realize this isn't serving me. This is not feeling good right now. I have, and this has been very recent, and I, I just, I hate that it took me so long to get to this. But, and I tell people all the time, if I make a mistake, I'm like, I'm giving myself some grace on that. You know, I'm not going to beat myself up. Everybody makes mistakes and I can't be perfect all the time and I'm going to trip and fall and hopefully you'll be there to catch me. If not, I'll dust off my knees and get up on my own. But you've got to give yourself that grace and that compassion to make those mistakes because you, I, I know fail forward is a popular term right now, but it's so true. If you're not failing, you're not learning. You know, if you get everything right all the time, where's the fun in that? So I agree. So, I agree. And getting comfortable, like you said, with your messiness is my new exciting place to live. Mm -hmm. Like when I make a mistake, I crack up laughing and I have fun with it now yeah. because I'm getting comfortable with that uncomfortable that I thought existed when you, when you got something wrong. You know, I, I, I think we talked about this. I'm a huge journalist, journaler. So anybody that listens to the podcast knows this. And um, one of the things that I track a lot of stuff, I'm kind of obsessive compulsive about what I track. But one of the things that I track is um, my lesson learned for the day. Love it. You don't learn a lesson if you don't fail at something, if you don't make a mistake. And I can promise you every day I learn something, <laughs> no matter how small it is. Oh, so so for, the pe agree. for people like you and me that are recovering perfectionists, how can you <laughs> shift those patterns of perfectionism and um, to re release that control? Oh my gosh. Number one is you have to actually first notice if it's a negative behavior for you. You have to admit that it's not serving you. So being a control freak, for me, I wired it that it was a positive thing for me because I got, I got stuff done. Right. I would be the organizer. I would, you know, make sure things happen and I would, you know, deliver. So for a number of years, if someone said, you need to release some of that control, or let go of being a perfectionist, I probably would have stopped talking to them and thought, what's your problem? <laughs> because to me, it was what I thought made me me, made me, you know, so effective in, um, in life. And so first you have to identify, is it a problem for you? If it's not, then leave it alone and, and keep living your journey because everyone's on their own journey, right? And I let people have their experiences without the judgment and just have compassion for the space they're at. Um, so first, notice if it's a problem for you. And then the second thing is, if you do if you do come to the conclusion that, yes, I don't want to have this amount of control in my life anymore, I feel like I'm you know, moving further and further away from my husband and my work and mm -hmm. my children, then 
I actually engaged in a coach. I didn't go to the coach though to stop being a control freak. That's what came out as one of my behaviors of the problem. So that's what I mean. People think they know what the problem is. I guarantee you, and this is a big thing I'm staking right now, whatever a client comes to me with as a presenting problem, that ain't it. Mm, yep. It's deeper. It's deeper. Like my control was what people would deem as my presenting problem, but my control was operating over top of a belief about myself that wasn't serving me. So that I had is- to get really comfortable and have that coach help me with the belief and leave the control alone, knowing that once the belief was reframed, once the belief was released, that behavior would be released as well. So it's good to have a coach that doesn't work with you on the symptoms of the problem, that you have a coach like myself and others I know that work with the cause, the deep cause. Otherwise, you're going to keep having those problems appear in life. You'll go to another job and you'll find another manager that annoys you. You'll go to another job and, oh, look, this manager's annoying me again. You haven't got to the cause of why you get triggered by these people in your life. So much good stuff. Again, Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love that you've used your coach, but you still have used coaches in your career to help you get better. And my favorite saying is you can't read the label on a jar from inside the jar. You've got to be outside, right? right? So you need that other perspective, that somebody to hold that mirror up so that you can see what it is that's holding you back. It's just so important. So what advice can you share with job seekers to help them not stress or, you know, um, when they're searching for their next job? Yeah. Gosh, there's so many things. I was just thinking what's coming up is um, we really need to stop fighting ourselves. And what I mean by that, as soon as I stopped fighting myself, I found myself. So if you're out there and you're like, oh, I'm having no luck with these jobs and I'm applying and it's just not working for me. I say start again with getting clear on what it is you want, anchoring into what that feels like. Okay, if I'm working in that job, this is what my office is going to look like, I hope. This is what the people are going to say to me. This is the clothing I'm going to wear to work. This is a chair I'm going to sit in. Like get really specific Mm -hmm. on what it is you want and put yourself there and smile and enjoy that feeling and really allow your mind, the reticular activating system, to go searching for that. Rather than searching for, I'm not going to find the job I want. No one wants to hire me. You're actually setting that up for yourself. So I always start with that. I then also ask people to mind their habitual thoughts. Like mind their habitual thoughts when they're looking for something and feeling quite hopeless towards it. Let that go and turn your feelings of nervousness into excitement. Because in the body, excitement and nervousness feels the same. Mm -hmm. So if you are saying to yourself, I'm nervous and you feel like it's nerves, go, no, I'm actually excited. I'm actually excited. I'm actually excited. And do what you need to, to shift your state. Some people like to stand like Wonder Woman and put their hands in the air for a couple of minutes before they go into an interview, because it's impossible to feel a negative emotion when you're looking up and got your hands in the air. You try and say, I'm miserable when you're up there and doing it. It doesn't, it doesn't kind of click in. Um, some people like to meditate before a job interview, or they might just need to go in the mirror and talk to themselves and, and say some stuff that they actually believe and is positive. Now, there's a difference. Some people say to me, Deb, affirmations don't work for me. And I agree with them. There is an element of affirmations that don't work for people if they have a belief that is the opposite. Mm. So if I'm standing in the mirror going, Deb, you've got this, you are so worth this, you're worthy, worthy, worthy. And then deep down, I've got something still lingering that tells me I'm not worthy. The unconscious belief will win over any affirmation I put on top of it. So this is where I work with people to go, let's get rid of the beliefs that will actually be um, uh, opposite to what it is you want, those affirmations. So they can actually team up and integrate and be congruent rather than incongruent. That is so great that you just said that because it really echoes what Hal Elrod, the author of The Miracle Morning, said a few episodes ago, and he gave a great formula, and I'm not even going to try to give that formula here. Just go back and listen to the other episode, Um, but it was so good, and he said the exact same thing. He says, people have been doing these affirmations wrong. This is how you need to do it, and he laid out this formula. It's like, I am, and whatever it is, because... And, and like, I'll butcher it, so um, just go back and listen to that. But it was basically exactly what you just said, because if you've got that opposing belief, it's not going to work, because you can say it all day long, like, I have a million dollars in the bank, and I'm sitting here going, no, I don't, you know? 
you know, I am a millionaire. Yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> so, so that makes perfect totally. sense. Yeah. So, totally. Or I've had a client say, I'm going to meet the man of my dreams. I'm going to meet the man of my dreams. And then she's got a belief saying love isn't safe. Mm. So the belief's going to win, and then she's not going to meet that man. So it's nice to unravel that so she can meet the man of her dreams. <laughs> such good stuff. Such good stuff. So what advice can you share to help people pursue success in their careers without sacrificing those personal relationships? Gosh, uh, I, for me, would recommend, um, and you could do this on your own. I use my coach, but you can do this on your own, where you get really clear on what's important to you in your relationship or your personal relationship. So what is the important values you hold there? And then what are the important values in your career? And be clear and be concise because if you know in your relationship, your husband's number one value for you and your number one value for him is quality time and you're working 24 seven, you're gonna cause a conflict in your personal and professional life. So get really clear on what's important to you in your relationship, what's really clear important to you on your career and work in where they can intertwine and support each other rather than disconnect and move you further and further away from each other. So I get really clear on that. I am a big fan of the love languages. If you haven't mm -hmm. really done it, my love language is acts of service. And so my husband knows that and I know what his is and we get to communicate and match each other where we're at. And I think that's been really valuable as well. So, um, it's basically also honoring your personal boundaries. So what I mean by that is to be successful in my career, I actually don't negotiate how much sleep I have. My sleep is set and I know I'm a better, more effective person if I get seven and a half hours. So I will not let my sleep suffer in order to, um, to be at work at a certain time. Mm. I will make sure that bucket's protected so I can be more effective and I can be more wide doing less. And that's the difference because I had the formula back the front in the past. I thought the more I do, the more I be when it's actually who we be is what we see out there in the world. So I protect my personal boundaries around sleep, around my morning meditation, around walking with my husband and dog every morning. I know if I skip those, I might as well stay in bed all day because I'm not the same energized, peaceful, content human being if I skip over those. So get really clear on what it is that fills your cup and, and honor it. That is such good information. And I love that you brought up the love languages. And I just want to touch on that for just a second because I, after do, reading the love languages, we discovered a real big flaw in our relationship, Steve and I did, and that was his love language was acts of service as well my love language is words of affirmation. And so I was treating him with my love language and he wasn't getting it. And he didn't understand <laughs> why I wasn't doing things yeah. for him, acts of service. And he wouldn't, you know, he wasn't just all flowery with words towards me. And I'm like, God, can't you just tell me I'm pretty sometimes? You know, <laughs> words of affirmation, that I did a good job. I, so that's such a great tool, even in business, to figure out how people want to be communicated with. So good. And even in children, like you can do it for your children yes. now, which is equally important because in one of um, the papers I'm studying and the research is showing, um, when we're children, there's three things that we're observing that shape how we view relationships when we're older. And the first one is how much love and attention and time did I receive from my mother? How much love, attention and time did I receive from my father? And how much did I witness my mum and dad loving each other? when I say loving, how they communicated, how right. they interacted. And if one of those are out, it can also impact that child to do the exact same thing when they're in that position, whether they be a mother or a father. Huh. So why I wanted my children to, um, why I want my children to do the love languages so I could meet them where they're at. And also I wanted them to see me give love to their dad, not just because of that study, but because so they are okay with public affection. They're okay with it not being just something, you know, that have, you know, parents shut the door and who knows what they do in there. But like we're very open with cuddles and kisses and things. And I think it's important that love is, is seen. I think that is so important too. And you are not going to believe this. Our time has just flown by. So um, we are to the segment where we do our VIP questions. Are you ready for those? Okay. Yes, I'm ready. Awesome. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you take with you? 
my husband Lance, who loves my love languages and honors them, so that's why I take him. My dog Tui, because it's impossible to have a bad day when he's around. Oh. And the Abraham Hicks animated YouTube series. Oh. So I could listen to it every day. That's a good one. That's a good one. So, um, so in, you talked a little bit about this, but what is one thing you do to start your day that sets you up for success? Yeah, sure. It's definitely my morning ritual. So I wake up and I, I get to meditate with my hubby um, beside me for 20 minutes. And then we will go for a walk, usually for half an hour. And then we come back and I might do some reading or journaling, like you mentioned. And then we have a delicious cup of cappuccino together. And then we maybe do some yoga or maybe we don't. And I just love that one hour that I give to myself um, and share it with my husband and dog that sets me up for such a productive day out there. You know, I have to say, you are probably one of the first people that I have met that shares their morning ritual with their husband. And, you know, Steve and I do our morning ritual together as well. We do our meditations and everything and then our journaling together. And it has deepened our relationship so much. And I just really applaud you that you and your husband are doing that as well. That's awesome. You too. You too. <laughs> no, I, I love it. Okay, so my final question. If your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? This one out of all the questions I sat with, and I think what I came up with because I feel like my life journey is just becoming um, more and more real and fulfilled because I've let go of so much. So I'd say it's probably something around the lines of the compassionate coach who helps bring out the greatness in others. Boom, mic drop. And I know that you are doing that without a doubt. So Deborah, how do people find you if they want to engage with you on NLP or on coaching? How do, how do we find you? Yeah. Um, easiest would be my website, which is my name, www.debraworkman.com. And you'll see my NLP trainings coming up in May and it's global. So we've gone online thanks to COVID and what, they've what it's taught us. Uh, and then my coaching's ongoing and I work with a selective amount of people and I always encourage people to reach and have a conversation with me to ensure I'm the right fit. And then we go from there. It's not something you can just tell by looking at someone. It's a connection you need to feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and we'll have your information in the show notes so people can find you easily just in case, because there's many different ways to spell Deborah. So with that, Thank you. I have one last thing to say to you. You are a VIP. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.